Okay, um, I think we'll get started here. Uh, I want to welcome all of our audience, both here live and uh, on the internet, to our um, webcast of our double patent day. So today was the patent day of the Supreme Court. Uh, two patent cases, which I thought was the first time in, and I don't want to guess, but something like 40 years that there have been so many patent cases in one day in the Supreme Court. And they are related cases. Um, so we'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, but first, uh, I just want to welcome everyone um, to our Pigeon series, which we like to have all the IP cases of the Supreme Court. There have been a number in recent years. Uh, we like to have the, uh, the counsel and the Miki from the cases discuss the oral arguments the day of or shortly after the case. Uh, so today we have uh, Miki and counsel for all four parties involved today. Um, and I will briefly introduce them, uh, and then we'll turn the time over to them to give us uh, a sense of these cases. Uh, so to my immediate right is uh, Brian Pentaya uh, from Lenny Ryan, uh, who represents uh, an amicus in the case, Blue Cross and Blue Shield, um, who represents the petitioner in Highmark versus All Care Management. Um, next to him on his right is Donald Dunner of the Finnegan Law Firm. Uh, he represents the respondent in Highmark versus All Care, which is All Care Management. Um, he's a partner at Finnegan. Uh, and I believe it was your first argument in the Supreme Court today, Donald. So uh, we'll have to get your uh, reaction to that as we go on. Um, to his right is Ryan Morris, who represents the respondent in Octane versus Icon. Uh, he's a partner at uh, the Sidley Austin firm. And to his right is Stephen Holzhauser, who is a partner at Harness Dickey, who represents the petitioner in the Octane case. Um, so, like I said, two cases at the Supreme Court all of them have to do with one single sentence of the Patent Act, um, which is, the court in exceptional cases may award reasonable attorney fees to the prevailing party. That's the entire sum of today's argument was about what that one sentence, and particularly a couple of words in that sentence, may and uh, exceptional actually mean uh, for patent cases. So uh, to begin, why don't we start uh, all the way down on the right uh, with Mr. Holthauser. The first case of the day was Octane versus Icon. And if you can just set the stage about what the issue is in the case, uh, and briefly give us your client's position in the case. You have to. Um, briefly, what the issue is is the uh, interpretation of exceptional in Section 285 and uh, the struggle to try and give some meaning to that term, some guidance so that it's not an arbitrary, standardless exercise of discretion. Even though we know that the district court was granted a great deal of discretion. Uh, I'd say the issues turned on the plain meaning of the word, the legislative history, as well as there's quite a bit of uh, case law to draw upon. It's a unique statute in that there's a period of about six years, between 1946 and 52, uh, in which the district and courts of appeals were deciding cases under the predecessor. And then when they passed this, uh, added this word exceptional in 1952, there's a reference in the legislative history to those cases. And uh, a big issue, I think, in the case is the extent to which that impacts the meaning that we're to give to it. Uh, and along with there's almost 60 years of jurisprudence altogether, and this is now the time the Supreme Court is considering this after all these years. Um, probably uh, one of the first fee shifting statutes that uh, in existence that were they're more, more common, they're more common now, they're more comfortable with the idea of fee shifting. 1946, 1952 was a rare concept. Uh, one thing I think comes through in some of the cases is a, is a bit of hostility to the concept and the departure that it represents from the American rule. So uh, I think that kind of sums up uh, our position. Great. So um, for some of the students here, the English rule in mostly all legal cases is the loser pays. If you lose the case, you pay the attorney's fees on the other side. The American rule is the opposite. Well, not the opposite, uh, but both sides pay their attorneys. So uh, the, the section 285 that we're dealing with here allows, in exceptional cases, judges to essentially adopt the English rule and force the loser in the patent case uh, to pay. So, uh, Mr. Morris, uh, based on that, if, if you could sort of uh, talk about your client's position in the case uh, and what the standard is currently at the Federal Circuit for what constitutes an exceptional case. Sure. So a lot of this stems from the Federal Service decision in Brooks Furniture, in which it uh, ostensibly sets forth the standard for an exceptional case determination. And in Brooks Furniture, 
The Federal Circuit said that uh, there are instances of litigation misconduct, Rule 11 sanctions, inequitable conduct in a variety of other circumstances. They'll deem that an exceptional case. And then they also created a, a call it a catch-all, if you will, and they said that in the absence of misconduct that, that that type described, you can also have an exceptional case determination if the claims that were there were objectively baseless and brought in bad faith. And so in this case, uh, there's no argument about any kind of litigation misconduct or other types of misconduct. So everything turned on whether or not Icon's case was fit within the standard of objectively baseless and brought in bad faith, and as presented to the Supreme Court was, is that the proper test when there's no, when there's no misconduct of any kind? Um, my client's position was this was a, uh, you know, that if you look to those cases that were referenced between the 46 and 52 Act, uh, in 52, when Congress passed the Patent Act and adopted this particular language, the revisor's note said that, in essence, they were taking the standards, the exceptional case meant the standards that were enunciated in those cases from 46 to 52. Um, and in those cases, one of them being, one of the standards was if it was unjustified. If the litigation was vexatious or unjustified, the position we have here is that that unjustified fits precisely within um, or synonymous with objectively baseless. Uh, the district court here found that it wasn't objectively baseless, and so she should stand. Um, okay, so, I mean, the, the case essentially is whether the Federal Circuit's standard is the right one. Right. Right. Um, and as we've seen, one theme, if, if you've been following our series here, is that the Supreme Court has taken a lot of cases with very strict standards of the Federal Circuit and often will make those strict standards less strict. They either adopt some uh, equitable considerations or at least say there are more considerations that need to be taken into account here. Um, so uh, you don't have to predict which way the justices are going to go, but just based on the argument today, did it seem like the justices had other ideas that they do reverse the standard of where they want it, uh, what, the, what the appropriate standard might look like going forward. Uh, I, I think from the argument today, there was, by the time of the second argument, it seemed as though the justices had got some of their concerns about the position we were presenting, which was that these words, these adjectives, someone even described it as the battle of the adjective, from these cases between 46 and 52 was not an exclusive set of terms. But we, we would use the term equitable traditional concepts. And so there's concepts that are there in fee shifting that we've all become comfortable with. They were starting to form between 46 and 52, words like vexatious, unjustified, litigation misconduct, inequitable conduct. But some of the cases also that talked about other types of similar conduct are equitable circumstances. It, it seemed as though, especially by the second argument, they're becoming more comfortable with the idea that it is this traditional concept. We don't need to actually have a single adjective and add to the word exceptional that Congress used and now import our own adjective that there's a broader range. Uh, so I say the main difference between our two positions is we want we embrace the, the broader concepts that you don't necessarily need to fit within one bucket. That you know, so view it as six buckets. Here's the unjustified bucket. Here's the vexatious bucket. And if you don't fill up any one of those buckets, you don't get fees. We view it more of a totality that you might not have enough of litigation misconduct to warrant sanctions uh, or the type of uh, misconduct that we're referring to, but there might be an element of it together with a weak claim, together with other indicia that together as a whole uh, warrant awarding fees and shifting fees. Uh, the two concepts that we think are important that the, the justices seem to be in agreement with was the idea that the purpose of this should be the further the broader purposes of the Patent Act, to discourage, encourage, incentivize, disincentivize certain types of behavior. Uh, that, uh, and I think there seemed to be some recognition of that. It's still hard to tell, obviously, uh, what standard, what formulation they'll come up with, uh, but I think that uh, it seems as though they were beginning to have a conversation amongst themselves about what the standard should be. I, um, you know, I haven't done this for too terribly long, but I can't say I'm that great at predicting the argument <laughs> in which way the Supreme Court's going to go. Uh, I, I thought they were all very, fairly comfortable with the idea that misconduct of some kind is the first part of the Brooks Furniture Test. They, they were comfortable with those being in the exceptional case. 
I've had a lot of more trying to struggle with, in the absence of that, what do we have, and what's the standard, what should it be, and how do we draw lines um, on where exactly uh, allow for an exceptional case and not allow for an exceptional case. Um, I thought a lot of the justices were espousing particular views, and not a lot of them overlapped particularly well. Um, <laughs> there's kind of individual determinations, and, and they're having, clearly having a conversation among themselves through a good part of the argument. Uh, I didn't see a ton of agreement across the board, uh, a lot of back and forth. I think Justice Breyer and Justice Scalia were having a particularly interesting conversation in front of most of us. But, uh, yeah. Great. Okay, uh, so now let's turn uh, to the second case, which is a related from the same statute. But here we're talking about the standard of review once we have a determination of uh, an exceptional case or a non-exceptional case, how the Federal Circuit reviews that determination. So let me start with Brian to sort of uh, set up the case and uh, give us your clients or your, your position in the case. Yeah. Well, thank you, Professor. Um, I represent the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association, which was uh, filed an amicus brief in this case, both at the cert stage and at the merits stage. Uh, Blue Cross's interest in this case is that uh, uh, patent litigation affects uh, everyone from the small businesses to large companies that are that, that get their health insurance from uh, from Blue Cross member companies, including companies like Highmark, who was the petitioner in this case. Um, you know, our, our view on this case is that uh, Section 285 has gone away from uh, other other uh, comparable fee shifting statutes, and that traditionally attorneys' fees were part of the traditional province of the, the district court. It was an inherent power of the court to award attorneys' fees. Those determinations were based on the totality of the litigation, what happened from the beginning to the end. And the trial court is the party that, that sees the case unfold from, from start to finish and can decide, was this case an exception to all the other cases that the, the district judge sees, or was it not? Now, certainly there are legal questions in there, and if a judge... A trial judge makes an error of law that is abusing discretion, but our view is that that uh, this is something that should be left uh, with the district court within the discretion of the district court. And the reason that it should be remain discretionary with the trial court is that Section 285 is a powerful deterrent. Whether you're a plaintiff or a defendant, a patent holder or an accused infringer, if you're going to behave uh, vexatiously in a lawsuit, if you're going to bring baseless claims or baseless defenses, you're going to run up a lot of legal fees for the party on the other side. And if there is no consequence, if there's little risk of a consequence, that will impact the way that a party behaves in the litigation. So perhaps the best way to police uh, patent litigation, uh, which has been received a lot of news lately, a lot of it not favorable, is through the robust enforcement of Section 285. Great. Thanks. Um, so Don Dunner, um, maybe you can present the other side, your client's position um, in this case about what should be the proper standard of review at the federal circuit. Uh, well, the point that was just discussed uh, mainly focuses on the non-practicing entity issue, or as some people call it, uh, patent assertion entities, or if you want to really be crude, trolls. Uh, that, uh, I did not spend very much time dealing with that issue, though we did in our brief. Uh, I need to give you a little background before I get into that, because most of the dialogue today was about which is the best entity, which court is the best well-situated court to deal with these issues. Uh, and I should tell you at the outset that all care's bottom line was that factual issues should be reviewed deferentially, which gives Highmark half of what it wanted, but that legal issues should be reviewed de novo, uh, sort of a bifurcated standard. And what you need to know is that at the heart of the issues today and through the briefing were two cases of the Supreme Court. One is the Pierce case and one is the Cooter case, and Pierce involved the Equal Access for Justice Act involving legal fees for whether a government position was substantially justified. And Cooter involved the Rule 11 issue of whether or not fees should be awarded under Rule 11 
for a violation of Rule 11, for filing a legal paper, be it complaints or some other paper, without justification for filing it. And those are the only two Supreme Court fee cases. And in both cases, the court found that there should be a unitary review, as Highmark characterized it, and that everything should be reviewed deferentially. And so the point of Highmark was that the whole basket should be reviewed deferentially, including legal issues and including factual issues. Our position, and they relied on the legislative history, the change in the 1946 Act, which had a discretionary term in it, changed in 1952 to eliminate the discretionary term and to put in the word exceptional in exceptional cases. And the question, one of the questions was, what was intended by that change? Because some of the commentators said, in effect, no change was, in fact, was intended, other than as reflected in the legislative history and the case law. And there were 19 appellate cases between 46 and 52 dealing with these issues. And so our point was, we had several points. One was that in all these cases, since there was great focus on what happened during that period, not a single case said that legal issues were reviewed deferentially. And moreover, a number of those 19 cases said that you can reverse this decision by the district court to grant or not to grant attorney fees if there's either an abuse of discretion or, it was stated in the disjunctive, an error of law. And everybody conceded, and all the cases conceded, that in fact, an error of law, even under discretionary review, is reviewable. But the twist on the situation was that Highmark argued that, well, we'll concede that pure errors of law, whatever that is, pure errors of law, are reviewed de novo, but that everything else is not reviewed de novo. And then they went ahead and they defined what they meant by pure errors of law as including statutory interpretation or maybe constitutional interpretation, which would have excluded all the things that took place in the actual case, which involved three claim construction issues and an argument about res judicata and collateral estoppel and an argument about misconduct in a transfer of a case came to get to our case. The fact is, and this didn't come up today, but it was on my list of things to cover, the justice, the solicitor general who argued, actually put a breach in the data and said, well, we think that pure errors of law include claim construction, but not the delta between the claim construction and what the parties were arguing. And there was some pushback on that by Justice Kagan on that issue. And so much of the debate dealt with the reasons for Pierce and Cooter to have deviated from all the probable cause cases dealing with Fourth Amendment issues and other issues, which went the other way, which basically held there must be de novo review of legal issues. And our argument was that there were, that Pierce basically said that there's no universal rule for fee cases. You have to look at which entity, which court is better situated to deal with the issues. And then it went through an elaborate analysis of the different issues. And we analyzed those issues and we said, in our case, those issues point the other way. We said Pierce and Cooter are highly relevant, but they point to us, not to Highmark. And then much was said about the fact that the Federal Circuit was formed in 1982 for the purpose of providing uniformity and predictability in patent decisions. And Rule 11 and EAJA cases 
uh, all went to 13 different circuits, whereas the 285 cases all went to the federal circuit. And therefore, that was the court that could provide you with guidance. And we talked about the huge fees, which engendered uh, a little uh, chuckle, a little dialogue between Chief Justice Roberts and me on whether our fees were too high. And that's why there was several cases of $30 million fees, which are really well. uh, The fact is that uh, there was a lot of discussion on which was the best court. Uh, Justice Breyer seemed concerned about the fact that uh, the NPE issue, he, he seemed very concerned about uh, that. But by and large, it was, uh, by large, it was an interesting uh, dialogue. Uh, there were some justices who didn't say very much, uh, maybe two or three. Uh, but other than that, it was kind of an interesting dialogue. And the fact is, our case was set to go first. And they changed at the very last minute, maybe the day before, they changed the order. And I personally think that was a good change because the Octane case uh, could well affect our case. Uh, possibly, it depends what they do with it. Uh, although the, uh, the, the SG brief in our case said that even if the Octane proposal for totality of circumstances Accepted, you still would have an objective uh, reasonableness component, and that was thought to be decided. So it may have an effect on our case, it may not have an effect on our case, but it was kind of an interesting one. Uh, uh, punctuated by somebody standing up in the back of the courtroom, and I did not, I knew somebody was screaming at the top of his lungs, saying, down with Citizen United or something like that. <laughs> they frisked him away pretty quickly. There's uh, a protester for a non-patent issue. <laughs> Clearly. <laughs> uh, and I think it was disappointed. I think they were expecting a case to be released today that, in fact, was not, right? Uh, so correct. he'd already planned the protest, and he decided to go through with it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think he helped the Citizen United cause. <laughs> <laughs> Great. So I think he actually had both... Uh, <laughs> so let's take a step back. <laughs> let's take a step back. We, a lot of these issues have been covered here. And, and uh, Mr. Dunner mentioned that there have only been two fee cases at the Supreme Court before today. And today we had two patent fee cases. So what, and then there's been a lot of talk about um, fee shifting patent cases. Uh, the, the Congress is considering a number of bills that involve fee shifting. Uh, Judge Rader of the Federal Circuit has written an op ed to the New York. Time suggesting what district courts can do along the fee shifting line. So, what is the court's interest? Why is today, why are there two patent fee shifting cases today? If we can maybe contextualize this more broadly, um, if anyone wants to chime in, why is the Supreme Court so interested in this topic? I'll, I'll try something. It, it, you know, it's hard to tell, but there has been a lot of press on non practicing entities. The White House has gotten involved in the dialogue. Uh, the Congress has gotten involved in the dialogue. Uh, and there have been uh, some recent Federal Circuit cases, the Kilo Pass case, the Raython case, in which the Federal Circuit has remanded uh, decisions, district court decisions, for a new look. Uh, where the fees were denied, we'll take another look at it. And Judge Rader has been giving speeches here and there and elsewhere talking about it. So it is a very hot topic, and the Supreme Court uh, has gotten very interested in the Federal Circuit in any event, and has granted certain a lot of cases. And I've heard that the Supreme Court case load this year was not very heavy, and there were Cases. So there may be a lot of reasons. <laughs> there may be a lot of reasons, but I suspect they all had some impact on why the court took this case. And then just recently, the light and ballast case was handed down, which you may or may not know about, involving uh, the question of whether you give deference to a district court's claim construction. And that was a six to four decision. And I will not be surprised if that ends up on the Supreme Court's list. So the Supreme Court has gotten very interested in these procedural issues. You know about the I4I Microsoft case. I was involved in that case. And the issue was, 
what should the burden of proof be on about a patent for prior art? PTF should be partnered, should it be clearly convincing? And the Supreme Court actually affirmed the $290 million federal circuit decision. And the only unfortunate part of that was I was not on the contingency. You know, to add to one thing you said, though, I mean, the perception is the Supreme Court does not grant certain patent cases with the intention of affirming the federal circuit. But with that said, I think I was the, the justices today had, I think, had a degree of deference to the federal circuit, recognized the federal circuit's expertise in patent law, asked them why should the Supreme Court be articulating the standard for patent cases when, when the, when the federal circuit has this expertise in exclusive jurisdiction to hear patent appeals. And they also commended the attorneys arguing as knowing more about patent law than the justices. Justice Breyer said he did. I disagree with him. And then he came back and said, no, he said, I'm right. But, you know, I think in terms of what, what made this issue, why did this get any grant at this term as opposed to previous terms? I mean, certainly there is a lot of discussion before Congress right now. The president's issued several executive orders. The state attorney generals have been, have been targeting non-practicing entities. It's been, you know, gotten a lot of attention and debate lately. But the immediate reason why this, why at least the Highmark case got granted was the federal circuit was sharply divided in the, the on-bond decision. It was a six-five decision, which is the closest thing you get to a circuit split since all patent cases go to the federal circuit. And there were two sets of dissenting opinions from the denial of on-bond review, very sharply criticizing the standard articulated by the federal circuit. So that's why it got on the radar at this term as opposed to the last term or terms ahead in the future, aside from the, you know, the broader policy climate and this issue of getting more attention. I agree with the, I agree with the letter of comment in particular is that I think that Kelo Pass didn't exist at the time it took cert. And you kind of refer to, I've heard someone refer to Kelo Pass as the federal circuit's amicus brief in the cases. But I think the Highmark dissent to the on-bond discussion that goes on there is a very lively discussion that actually is the backdrop of the issue in both of these cases, which is really a question about the heart of the federal judicial system. And that is which court, which, what is the role of district courts, courts of appeals, courts of review in relation to each other? And there is a very divided lines within that, those opinions. Even the federal circuit itself is conflicted about its own, quote, expertise when it comes to patent litigation. I don't think anyone questions their expertise when it comes to issues relating to technology and claim construction and so forth. But in this fee statute is a litigation issue. And that is how do we regulate the behavior of litigants? And there is a, even the federal circuit itself is at odds with itself over what their particular role should be within the federal judicial litigation system. And I think that's something that the court cares deeply about, always has, because they realize district courts are the workhorse of the judicial system. And that the federal circuit keeps taking, you know, everything has to be de novo reviewed and less and less discretion with the district courts. What we have here is a statute which the federal circuit didn't exist when the statute was passed. So we can't really say that Congress intended to trust the federal circuits with this. They actually invested the discretion with the district courts. And then the court, the cases that we have, as Mr. Dutter referred to, that we've all had to unfortunately review during that time period were by the courts of appeals, the various circuits. And there's no, there's no consistency between those opinions. They use different adjectives on different situations. Some of them preface their words with if and only if. Some of them give a long list of disjunctive adjectives and end with or other things of like, of like nature, which is obviously an open-ended list. So I think that at issue today in both arguments was a question of which body of the federal judiciary is best suited to make these kinds of calls in patent litigation. And what is the role of those courts in making that? Because I do think they perceive some abuse that goes on, whether or not they're motivated by that precise problem. That wasn't the problem Congress was addressing in 1946 and 1950. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, counsel. That concludes argument in this case.
do. And, uh, the word troll is a, is a, it's just a label that uh, if you can define it, then maybe we can decide whether it, it actually applies to someone. But um, the, you know, what Congress was focusing on in 1952, they said what they were focusing on. Uh, they were looking at making sure that patent, uh, that accused infringers didn't think that if they infringed the patent, all they would have to worry about would be paying royalties. They wanted there to be some other skin in the game so that they also, if they engage in certain type of behavior, they might also have to pay the patentee's fees. Uh, the reverse is true that they intended to apply to defendants so that in order to prevent gross injustice that uh, they thought could be um, also occurred within the system. So I think a lot of this feels a certain frustration with the status that the Congress gave us, but I also think there's a certain amount of genius in what they did back then, is that they left things open for what the Supreme Court has quite often referred to as the multifarious nature of the conduct we're trying to regulate, which is the conduct of parties in litigation. And litigation is too complex, too diverse, to put in little boxes, little buckets. Uh, and you have many different things that, from our point of view, the district judges are probably the best ones to make these calls. Because they live the case from start to finish. Uh, as my partner pointed out today, they see far more patent cases than not just the ones that make the federal circuit, because most patent cases settle. So they see how the parties behave, they see the nature of the claims, they see what, what they, they settle for in many instances, and so they know uh, what, what is happening. And they have the best picture of how did your claims change as throughout the course of the litigation, how things evolve. Um, they also are able to be able to judge. I think what Justice Kennedy had this analogy today that after two to three years of a case pending for a district judge, and he's had to do all this work and wade through all of these weeds and get there and say, look, after all, after all that, there's nothing there. And that was the, uh, the hypothetical that he gave that is the experience that many district judges have in patent cases. Is that at the bottom, at the end of the, of the digging process, it turns out there's nothing there. And that they are able to make that judgment uh, by, by comparison with their other cases as well as their patent cases as to whether or not this is the kind of thing that should be uh, exceptional. And we've got two cases here that have facts to them that, that from our point of view, they'll illustrate to some extent, both sides' positions, depending on your point of view. Uh, but the facts, uh, for example, in our case, I think provide a very illustrative set of circumstances to carry the debate to the practical, the practical uh, things that we deal with in district courts. Okay, so let me pick on two uh, ideas about uh, specialness in the patent system that you touched on. So one thing I saw that I was intrigued about is this idea about who's the best decision maker, right? The, the circuit court or the district court. I knew that was going to be there, but there was some indication from the Supreme Court, that is, I think it was in the first case, that maybe the Federal Circuit should be deferred to, the Supreme Court should be deferred to the Federal Circuit because they're an expert court. And that whatever rules they make, maybe they're not the best, but maybe they're better than what we're going to do. And that's, that's, that's a thing that goes against sort of this idea that the Federal Circuit's often reversed or always reversed by the Supreme Court. And the second one is that the patent cases are somehow special, right? The other thing that the Supreme Court has shot down in the eBay case and other types of cases. And uh, the quote I loved was from Justice Alito today, who said, so you've got these patent attorneys showing up in court, they are different from other other attorneys. And everyone laughs, got, got a, a big laugh about it. A room full of patent attorneys saying that they're different, and that maybe they should, patent cases should be treated differently for exceptionality than other types of cases. So if anyone has any comments on either of those, whether patent cases should be different or the same as any other type of case, and whether there should be some sort of def deferral, not just from the Federal Circuit to the District Court, but from the Supreme Court to the Federal Circuit. Um, I, I could probably, uh, from my point of view, I'm going to vote for the new patent law. I mean, I would definitely refer to Mr. Gunner's expertise in this area, because uh, he's done far more of it than I have. But from my perspective, complex litigation in all forms is complex litigation. And while you specialize in an area, um, you think your area is, but there's these complexities that occur in litigation occur in every case. You have parties behaving badly, you have parties behaving properly, you have them bringing you know, proper claims. Um, the Supreme Court knows what the purposes of the Patent Act are, the District Courts know what the purposes of the Patent Act are. They can make those assessments as, in terms of whether or not this is a valuable patent that deserves protection or whether or not someone's asserting a worthless patent and trying to distort it. 
to settle it for a fraction of what it might cost to defend. Right. Let me respond. The fact is that same argument was made in 1981 and 1980 in the years before the Federal Circuit was formed, and you had district courts and circuit courts all over the country going in disparate ways, and you could have the same patent litigated in Minneapolis, Minnesota before the Eighth Circuit, and that patent litigated in Houston, Texas before the Fifth Circuit, and you'd get a totally different result. And in this particular case, in our case, I'm our uncle, you had a prior case in the Eastern District of Virginia before the chief judge of that court, same claim, same claim interpretation issue, going in opposite directions. The Eastern District came first, the Trigon case was in all peers' favor, and then the Texas court went in the other direction, and something I didn't mention today, but which is in our brief, Highmark acknowledged in an interrogatory answer that the claims were, the claim interpretation issues were essentially the same. So that is a poster child for why, if you've got a statute which is reviewed by a single court, as distinguished from Rule 11 and EAJA, which is reviewed, which are reviewed by 13 appellate courts, that speaks volumes for having that single court review non-deferentially the legal decisions of the district court. The district courts are not in a position which is half as good as the Federal Circuit, notwithstanding their own disputes, to resolve those legal issues. And I might mention that I was asked, I guess, I forget who asked that, it might have been Justice Roberts, asked me, what about the fact that there is such dissension in the Federal Circuit, which is a point you made, a 6 to 5 split here, 6 to 5 split in Akamai, 6 to 4 split in Lighting Ballast. My answer was, well, it's one court with a split, they end up with a decision, just as the Supreme Court splits all the time, but it's a single court, a single decision, and it provides us with national guidance. Whether I made the point, I don't know, but I think that was one of the highlights of my points. I don't know, I think that the fact that the Federal Circuit wasn't in existence in 1952, when the 285 was promulgated, doesn't play any better than the fact that in Pierce and Cooter, they looked at all these, which court is better situated, not with regard to when EAJA was passed, not with regard to when Rule 11 was passed, but today, which court is better situated to deal with these issues. And I can tell you, you can take, there are maybe a few courts that have lots of bad cases, Eastern District of Texas, Delaware, maybe a couple, maybe Chicago, a couple of others, but most of the judges in the country, a point made by Justice Alito, hardly see any bad cases. Some judges wouldn't know a patent from a hole in the wall if they saw it, and they are not in a very good situation or a very good position to make, to evaluate my constructions. And so I, from my view, my point of view, it's obvious that there are only nine justices who will agree with this. Justice Breyer had made some points that might lead him in another direction, but it seems to me that the bottom line is that should be the deciding point, at least in our case. Your case presents a different issue. Your case presents an issue. What should the test be where a virus was sustained? But obviously, this is debatable. We could sit here all day and have a very pleasant debate, and none of us would walk away feeling that the other had knocked him out. Nobody's not that way today. It was a very spirited debate. One thing I was going to note is, I interpreted part of that to do with the language of the statute, which is the exceptional case, and who's best suited to determine whether something is exceptional, and we banned it out to common understanding that it's uncommon. A district court may see hundreds of patent cases, or a district court may see one or two in a year. How can they really make a determination? In fact, the Supreme Court may accept cert more often, but it's still not seeing the same number of cases that the Federal Circuit is seeing. And so 
think some, there's some inclination to look at the Federal Circuit and say, well, look, they're saying every patent case that gets appealed across the nation. So they may be, in this particular circumstance, best suited to actually determine what is exceptional for a patent case. And that's the part of how I read the, the question there was that issue specific to the, the language of the statute. Right. And, that, and I think that is one way to look at exceptional. Um, probably where there's a disagreement is, is that is, comp, is exceptional a numerical concept? Clearly, if it's a numerical concept, there's no question that the Federal Circuit sees more patent cases. But if the kind of, as the Supreme Court has called before, the multifarious behavior they're trying to regulate in any fee shifting statute, whether it be in the Egypt context or civil rights context or many of the other contexts in which they've decided fee shifting cases, um, I, I think that commonality has, look, has a look at the totality of the behavior of the litigants in the party. And so, I certainly agree with that. I don't, I don't, there's not much difference in the opinion that the Federal Circuit is the place to resolve claim construction. And there's no, I didn't hear anything from the Supreme Court to question that for a second today that they clearly should be deferred to when it comes to issues of claim construction. Um, but when it comes to issues of whether or not the party's behavior warrants a fee, there's many other factors besides the merits of the claims that come into it. Uh, this case is, ex is exemplary. We have an entity that is a practicing entity of sorts, but doesn't practice this patent. No one has ever paid a dime to practice this patent. Uh, and in fact, it doesn't work. Uh, it's, a, it's a noisy uh, elliptical exercise machine. When it, when it finally got made for purposes of the trial, there are some email evidence that suggests an element of bad faith, perhaps not enough to prove by clear and convincing evidence under the Brooks standard that it is subject to bad faith. And the problem we have with Brooks ultimately is that it lifted entirely out of PRE. Uh, it, it didn't exist anywhere, even in the Federal Circuit's own jurisprudence, until about 12 years after PRE, if I do the math correct. So that, uh, which was basically a test to, pr to protect assertion of the, uh, of the right to petition the government, a First Amendment interest, uh, to accept it from the norm community doctrine. Uh, and the Federal Circuit lifted it wholesale to apply and said, well, this is what we're going to do to determine whether the fees uh, should be shifted. The problem is that it looks at only two factors and it looks at them in the most extreme terms. Uh, and what it fails to miss is the alley, uh, the way in which things relate together as a whole, the concept that the whole is greater than the sum of parts. Uh, and uh, the, when it comes to that decision, the district court may have all the experience and, exp and uh, knowledge it needs. Yes, yes. Sorry. If I could add one point, it's something we raised in, in, in both of our amicus briefs is that in terms of the district court may not be an expert in patent cases. And you know, we ask how do patent cases differ from other cases, but you can ask that question about any type of case that's in front of a district court docket. If you go down to Alexandria any Friday on motions day, you'll see every type of case from patent cases to super fun cases to CERCLA to uh, ERISA cases, securities cases, diversity cases. What district courts are good at is moving a case from filing through discovery to pretrial to trial to post-trial motions. They're good at moving a case from beginning to the end, and they're good at evaluating the party's conduct of the case from beginning to the end. And that was one of the points that we tried to raise in our amicus briefs, making why the district court is, is uniquely situated. But on, on your second point, uh, Professor Anderson, about uh, what, is the, what role does the Federal Circuit play here relative to the Supreme Court? You know, my prediction is, particularly in, in, in the Octane case, what's going to happen is that the, the Supreme Court will come down with a, a broad set of guidelines that loosen the standard for awarding attorney's fees, then leave it up to the Federal Circuit to come up with the, the proper implementation. So they may overturn the Brooks Furniture Standard, or may say there are instances beyond, beyond a claim subjectively based. So you can look at the totality, but then leave it up to the Federal Circuit with its expertise in patent law to come up with a uniform national standard that implements uh, the, the broad guidelines set forth by the Supreme Court. So for those of you out there who take my patent class, you will recognize this argument is what's happened to a lot of Supreme Court cases, which is saying, Federal Circuit, you got it wrong, but we don't know what's right. Try again. Right. So that's been sort of a theme that that's one possible outcome in this case. And to give a little color to some of the comments we've had here, uh, 
district, for those who don't know, we don't file patent cases as often as, as these gentlemen do. District courts see a very disparate amount of uh, patent litigation. The Eastern District of Texas and the District of Delaware, I think, get about 40% of patent cases currently, which is a huge amount, right? Those are two small districts with uh, I think five or six judges each. Um, every other district court gets less than two or three percent of the of the total. So a judge in even Seattle is much less likely to be familiar with patent cases than a judge in Marshall, Texas. Um, on the flip side, the Federal Circuit only has one judge who's ever been a district court judge, Judge O'Malley. Everyone else has always been an appellate judge. So there might be some arguments against them making decisions about district court practice when only one of them has that sort of experience. So all of these issues are sort of in play uh, with the Supreme Court's decision. So uh, let me ask one more question, then we'll, we'll turn it over to comments so you guys can start thinking about your questions. Um, so the last question is, are these cases related? How we've seen a little bit about this. About uh, it was nice that they switched the order because you guys didn't have to talk about their case throughout the case. But uh, are these cases tied to each other on the outcome, or not? They, they may or may not be. The, uh, <laughs> the the SG and its brief in the Highmark All Care case basically said. Uh, uh, I even remember, I think it's page four of the brief, that it referred to Octane and said that even if Octane is decided on a totality of circumstances basis, uh, there could still be an objective baselessness component of it, and that would be decided however the court decides it. Uh, if, on the other hand, the court were to eliminate any objective baselessness standard, I guess it could have. Yeah, and in terms of Octane, our position, ICON's position has been that the, the outcome of, of IMARC really wouldn't have any kind of impact. The district court below um, made particular findings that there was no objective baselessness, there was um, no bad faith that was affirmed by the, the court. And so we didn't see any sort of change in the standard of review by the Federal Circuit that would really have an impact. Um, you know, I won't disagree with my colleague in terms of how the Octane case may in fact impact Highmark, could or couldn't, it all depends. Great, so with that ambiguous answer, um, <laughs> we'll turn it over to any comments people might have in the audience. You just raise your hand or you can come in. Professor Flynn? Uh, <clears throat> so let me just start with a question that, that um, helps students actually kind of think about their career choices, but does, does tie into some of the themes of the case, which is, can each of you divulge whether you are a patent lawyer, either in the sense that you pass the patent bar or in the sense that, you know, high percentage or all of your cases are patent litigation cases, and how that experience has or has not helped you in these particular cases or in some of these uh, kind of patent appellate cases that you do? So let me rephrase this for people that are watching online. Uh, so the question was, uh, for, the, for all the panelists, if you consider yourself a patent attorney, whether you've passed the patent bar or not, and how that uh, expertise or sort of general legal knowledge has helped you or hurt you in your career. Brian, you want to start? Yes, I, I am a member of the patent bar, although the majority of my practice is litigation. Um, I think one thing that this uh, sort of helped me reform my perspective, particularly on these cases, is that after law school, I spent a year clerking on the Eastern District of Texas for, for Judge Davis. So uh, I got to see up close uh, a lot of patent cases coming through the court, amongst many other cases as well. So I mean, I think that informs my my view and uh, maybe you'd say my bias towards the district court and uh, in, in how these cases should be addressed. But uh, and of course, then from day to day litigating uh, uh, these cases as well. Uh, I am a patent lawyer, and. Uh, I've spent a lot of time litigating, but in recent years I've spent most of my time in appellate practice. Uh, I spent a lot of time before the Federal Circuit, I'm working at 160 cases there. And uh, certainly my patent background uh, has been invaluable in dealing with those cases, but having said that, I will tell you that I, I have the highest regard for non-patent lawyers uh, who handle patent appellate cases, including a number of members of the Supreme Court bar, 
Carter Phillips, who is arguing today on behalf of Icon, is a superb lawyer. I'm catching up with him. He has 77 Supreme Court cases on the line. I have 160 Federal Circuit cases. He doesn't have any close to that. But the fact is, he and others who are now practicing before the Federal Circuit on a regular basis do very well. They're very highly regarded. And they learn what they have to learn. And there are many at the district court level, general lawyers, who are just very good trial lawyers. It doesn't mean they don't need patent lawyers to help them. And they all seem to have that. But there are a lot of very bright people around. And they're not all patent lawyers who are handling patent cases. I don't know that I fall in that category, but I am not a patent lawyer. My practice is appellate practice. So I primarily am in the courts of appeals. But a substantial part of my practice involves the Federal Circuit. And I do a fair number of them. Nowhere near that. But I do do a substantial number of those to the Federal Circuit and the Supreme Court as well. But I think a big part of the way, at least I approach it, is when you get to the courts of appeals, even when you're talking about the Federal Circuit, really, there are appellate judges at that stage. And some people want to look at them as patent lawyers. But you've got judges like Judge Bryson, who is in the SG's office. He doesn't really come from a patent background. And so really what I view my job as doing is sort of trying to explain it to the layman, so to speak. And be a little bit of a translator in explaining some of these more difficult concepts. And we rely a lot on patent attorneys, those intelligent folks who really do understand this stuff, to explain it to us. And then we can try and translate it a little bit. I would say that I'm not a patent lawyer either. I'm probably more of a fallen candidate of a trial lawyer. I clerk for a district judge. My bias is always towards the district court. I was an assistant U.S. attorney for a little over 25 years and tried a large number of cases. A lot of trials that were in excess of six weeks, always in front of a jury, always in front of a court. And one of the pleasures of that is that I also handle the appeals at the court of appeals level. So I bring a fair number of appeals, including a lot of good appeals before the Eighth Circuit. But I definitely have come to appreciate the value of patent lawyers. And we approach these cases as teams. You need people that know the technology and understand the nuances of federal circuit law. But you also need people that have to talk to both judges and juries and witnesses in language they can understand. And that's a challenge. There's a tension similar to the tension in the patent system between spurring innovation and that overreaching the bounds of the monopoly power. There's a tension between patent lawyers and trial lawyers. You've got to give up a little bit of the detail, a little bit of the current concern for the perfection of the wording in order to get across the meaning. And that's a fun process to work together as a team on these cases. This case, for example, that Rudy Tosh is arguing today is both an appellate lawyer and a trial lawyer. I think it brought something to the court that perhaps was a little different in the real world perspective. He's in district courts day in and day out. So he's the business end of these words like exceptional and 60-year-old statutes. I would note that I was sitting to the left of the lectern and I noticed it's Rudy, is it? Yes. That he didn't have a piece of paper in front of him. Very impressive. I mean, all the rest of us had some paper. We didn't necessarily read it, but it was kind of a crutch that was there if we needed it. And he was able to cite pages and cite cases. I used to teach at Washington College of Law in my early days when Paul Rice was here. And now I've spent a lot of time teaching at GW Law School. And one of the things I do is I invite a fellow circuit judge to share my class each semester. And I had Judge Dyke, who wrote the majority opinion in the Highmark Altar, as one of my guests. And he was in private practice, in an appellate practice for Jones Day. And I asked him, I said, well, 
how did you prepare for our argument? And he said, well, he'd work his tail off preparing, and then he'd go to the podium and never have a stick of paper in front of him. And I said, well, what would happen if you were arguing before Judge Dyke? And Judge Dyke looked at you and he said, counsel, where is that in the record? And he said, I'd look him back and I'd say it's on page 81732. I mean, his legal fees must have been enormous. <laughs> That's very impressive. You can tell Rudy, I thought that was helpful. I appreciate it. So, I think you would probably concur with that. A good, a good appellate argument is a conversation with the judges. Absolutely. If, if, you are, if you are not reading something to them, and if you're having an eye to eye conversation with them, or they've got questions, they've got questions for a reason. And so, you need to have a conversation just like we're talking and answer your questions and address your concerns. I think the skill of appellate advocacy is that while I answer your question, I'm going to get my question too. So, and I find a way to weave that in from the side and bring it in back to play. But that is the fun. That's the fun of appellate argument is that those conversations with very smart people. So, I'll cap Sean's question by inserting myself in the panel. And I consider myself a patent attorney. I took the federal circuit. I worked in a patent litigation firm. And my second summer as a law student, I split my summer with a specialist patent firm and a general practice firm, which did significant patent work, but did other things. And I asked the same question to the partners. Is it better to work in a specialist firm or a general practice firm? And as you can guess, they both said that their model was the best. Because, for many of the reasons we've heard, right, the general practice said you need trial skills, right? You need to be a hard worker that knows how to do trials. And the patent stuff comes along with that. And the specialist firm said, well, you need to have patent attorneys understand how the technology works and get down to the details. And the answer is you need both, right? You need to be able to understand the litigation, understand the process, and be able to at least be comfortable with the technology or find someone who is that can help you be comfortable in front of the jury. So, all right. Other questions for the panelists? Yes. I was just going to say I listened to the argument today and read a little bit about the case. And I got the sense that the federal circuits, their current two-part case is quite difficult to meet. But I kind of lack a sense of perspective on just how difficult it is to meet. And I was just curious if anybody had any examples of, like, in a given year, is there, you know, a small handful of cases that successfully get that are successfully named exceptional cases, one or two? It's something that we looked at and anticipated as an issue. But probably the best way to put it is it's since Brooks. There have only been two cases in which the court affirmed an award of fees by the district court. And those two came after cert was granted. So, in that interim, there were none. And therefore, we're talking about accused infringement. No, after cert was granted. Kelo passed and Mark Deck. That was another one. There was two. I'm sorry, can I just say, how long of a time period is that? Well, 2005 is when Brooks was decided. There are interesting components of Brooks, too, that if you go back to the federal circuits on jurisprudence, that there is a, there's multiple moving parts to it. There's this two-part catch-all, I think, as it's been referred to. There's also a presumption that all patent infringement cases are brought to good faith. If you look at the cases they cite for that, and you actually then turn and trace those back to the cases they cite, the cases they cite, you eventually get to thin air. The presumption comes out of nowhere. The clear and convincing standard of proof is perhaps rooted in the word clearly, appears here and there, but not in any sense of proving the standard of proof. And the and between objectively basis and subjective bad faith. It's also true about the cases that say it's reviewed deferentially. They cite a case, which cites a case, which cites another case, and it goes back to thin air. And Judge Dyke pointed it out, in Judge Rogers' opinion, that those cases had no analysis of the standard of review, and therefore have no deferential value, no presidential value on that issue. Which is an interesting system of starting to cite when you think about it. But Brooks cites PRE after, with no analysis. We'll explain why he thought that PRE is applicable to a patent fee shifting statute. I guess my question is also about PRE. And the PRE is a copyright case, and copyright antitrust, litigation, copyright. And the plaintiff in PRE is Columbia Pictures. They have very good claims, but somehow, Ninth Circuit, the Supreme Court said, 
at, at 9.30, I guess, 9.30, that oh, this is the you, you tough luck. And I think you have, good, you have a good claim, but you, but somehow we, we, we first, and, 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 and later on, the defendant sued extra complaint. And that, I guess, so that's it's quite close case. And I guess that it, it makes more sense in that context why the Supreme Court High standard two part test. And, and I, I, I'm very curious about why federal circuit would adapt those copyright antitrust as, 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 a, as, a, as a standard. And how does the Supreme Court really respond to why federal circuit did that? I, I, said, I, I think that I'm really interested in a good answer for why they did it simply because they don't explain it. So we'd have to speculate as to why. Uh, PRE, I think, is best understood as a uh, going back to NOR. And NOR was an attempt to assert uh, antitrust liability for basically trucking companies uh, right into their kind of trying to change the law, petitioning your government. So the effect of the antitrust ban would be that there's trouble damages and that they're effectively calling that activity on the uh, so then PRE comes along with copyright, and I believe the issue there was public use. Uh, and so I think the result of PRE, if I'm not mistaken, was that it did not meet the test. And so nor is, nor is a stop sign, basically, that you can't call this activity, uh, you can't call it liable under the antitrust. Whereas PRE, if you satisfy the strict test, it's a go sign, uh, that you get to go ahead and pursue and uh, I think what we were, our position is basically all we're asking the court to do is just put up a yield sign. Uh, be careful, be cautious in bringing your claims as a patentee. Uh, and PRE is strict for a reason because it's protecting First Amendment protected activity. Uh, no different than the other sort of strict construction type of test that the Supreme Court adopts in other, other areas. Uh, and they later expanded on that to be okay, that was the reason why they did what they did. There's also a strong last paragraph in the BEK that says this is not all called to question fee shifting statutes. There was no, I think Carter is a different case than that one. I mean, as you look. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Let's see the Supreme Court. with them at the end of the day. No, I mean, one of the interesting things, um, and it doesn't come out a lot, but if, you know, if you go back through the briefing in BEK, I mean, a big part of the Solicitor General's position was that if PRE were made into the rule that was advocated by the advocates in B and K, that it would in fact affect Rule 11 sanctions, it would affect um, attorney's fees provisions, and it, it would in fact go as far as, uh, as I guess you'd say the Federal Circuit has done in this case. And I think there is a certain truth to the fact that when you're basically trying to add fees, put some kind of liability, when you're merely filing a lawsuit, you know, whether you're deeming the filing of the lawsuit itself, petitioning your government, as sufficient to, to impose something. Um, there is an interesting question there. I think at the end of the day, the Supreme Court wasn't really going that far, and the Federal Circuit really didn't explain why exactly, other than there is that intuitive sense that when you're not talking about misconduct, when you're not talking about special interest, you're not, you know, be it in the civil rights context or other kinds of provisions, that just purely filing a piece of paper and bringing my lawsuit and you're adding something to that, that there is a First Amendment interest involved. Yeah. So a lot of the discussion that we've heard about this case in a larger context is about the non-practicing entities. What's your take on how much decisions on either side of these two cases would affect the real-world practices there? Do you think that the decisions do actually have a big effect on how much we'll see the, those, the types of students that people are talking about change? Or do you think that fundamentally it's not going to be that fine and Well, I mean, I think it will. If the standard is changed to make the award of attorney's fees more more frequent, and if it's less a chance of being overturned, I think that will have an impact. Now, with that said, I mean, one hurdle to collecting attorney's fees in a non-practicing entity case is that typically the non-practicing entity or the patent assertion entity has no assets other than the patent and uh, a few other papers, articles, and corporations. So it can be difficult 
uh, to collect attorney's fees from a, from a non-practicing entity. So, I mean, that, that would be the one caveat and can be a major caveat in certain instances that I, that I would put on fee shifting by itself. One thing I'd, I'd add is that you know, there's the there's a possibility it can cut the other way as well. I mean, if, if it's a totality of the circumstances, anything goes type of situation, you could see companies say, I'll roll the dice and see what comes of it. And in fact, I might actually ask for attorney's fees because at the end of the day, I can have a mini trial and say, there are a whole variety of reasons why I am, in fact, go forward. Uh, you know, given the way the legislation is going, I think Congress has a different view and then tightening up the standards and, and making it a little bit easier to collect attorney's fees will, in fact, diminish some of these. Uh, let, me just sup let me just supplement that, uh, and then you, Chico, will get this question. Uh, the, the fact is that uh, I, I know there's a, there's a feeling that uh, the Federal Circuit has been writing the weakest briefs in Kilopass and these other cases, as seemingly happened in the KSR uh, situation. Mm -hmm where uh, after it became clear the Supreme Court was getting interest in this area, they started to backfill and the Supreme Court sort of said, call them call them them. Them. Call them. But the fact is, there's no doubt in my mind that the activity, the reason activity of the Federal Circuit, coupled with speeches being made by Chief Judge Rader and others, is going to have an impact on the district courts. And they are going <laughs> to uh, increase the uh, the frequency of shifting fees in cases like this and other cases. And when it's, if it's reviewed to no, know in our case, that will work both ways. And so I'm not sure ultimately it will have an impact, and we made that argument in our brief, it will have an impact on the patent assertion entity issue. So I can tell you that the 800 pound gorilla in the court court today for at least one justice was the patent assertion entity issue. I, I would just maybe add to your uh, answer, I think I don't give a variety of views here. Uh, the, the, the issue that strikes me about the NPE status is that in a fee shifting context, why does that matter? Uh, there's nothing illegal about being, they own the patent, they're the property owner. If someone's infringing it, they have a right to bring a claim. Uh, the question is, where does it enter into a fee shifting calculus? There are two points, I think. One is that uh, an NPE uh, is not subject to the same sort of counterclaim. They have less skin in the game, they have less risk. So they can bring a claim a little more rapidly without any fear of losing anything that's valuable. But the other thing is, is that it reflects value. If, if, they're, if they don't practice it and no one practices it, but people have been able to sue and extract royalties from, what is the value? That what the patent act was intended to protect. Uh, those are at least a, it shouldn't be a, the problem with talking about these things is you say, okay, well, that's, is that enough in and of itself? I doubt it. But is it something that you add together with four or five other criteria taken together as a whole? This case ought to be considered uncommon, uh, exceptional, and, and, and warrant fee. If the fee, if it does come to that, there will be, I think, a change in behavior on all parts. Defendants are going to have to think seriously about. I just going to have to think seriously about the claims they bring. The pattern, unfortunately, is, is that in the NPE cases, there is a much lower quality of the merits of the claims. That's why objectively baseless are objectively reasonable or some other word in the adjective war is, is important. What standard do we use to evaluate those claims? In, in actual practice, um, I mean, there are lots of horror stories, but if you natural practice, you know, when you hear an attorney on the other side say, yeah, yeah I acknowledge that our patent doesn't really cover what you do because you don't even do our patent covers, but I can't sell for $10,000 because that doesn't even get to cover my And when you hear that word come out of an attorney's mouth, it's like, is this really what we're talking about? That kind of behavior that ultimately I think is the kind of property relevant the room that the court's concerned about uh, goes again to the use of the court system. I want to go back three or four steps and ask Brian a question about what you said. If you can I agree with you, of course, that <clears throat> the NPEs themselves typically have little or no assets. But the party that is really at risk is the real party in interest, and that's the law firm. And that 
under this statute, the courts have the right, as I understand it, to impose these fee shifting upon the attorneys themselves. And many of the attorneys, while we are not as rich as Microsoft, we've got enough assets to be worth going after. You do, and Don does, everybody seems to know. I don't. But the patent attorneys, or the attorneys, non-patent attorneys representing NPEs, aren't they the people that are really at risk here? We know that that happened in Highmark Health Care. The district court judge initially sanctioned about five law firms and about 20 attorneys and all care. And then there were, under Rule 11, and then there was a request for reconsideration, because he had not provided a safe harbor, as was provided by Rule 11. And then he reconsidered, and he withdrew all the sanctions against the attorneys, and left the sanctions against all care. That's an answer to your question, because he could have done both. Yes, and in the typical NPE case, isn't that what is likely to be the ultimate result? If it turns out that fee shifting happens significantly more frequently than it has in the last 10 years. Can I ask you a question? I don't necessarily quite, do you think that 285 applies to attorneys? Yes, doesn't it? Isn't that- I think actually the Rule 11 and the inherent authority of the court to focus on attorney conduct. But I think primarily what we're talking about here is getting a party. Well, yes, but can it also apply to counsel for the party, when the counsel for the party is the real party in interest, and everybody in the courtroom, including the judge, knows that it's the attorney who is really earning all the money, is doing the work, and is- Well, there is some legislation that's been introduced in Congress right now that would allow, that would allow a person to reach through to the law firm or to the financiers of the litigation to collect attorney's fees in case you had a patent assertion that he has no assets. I mean, I doubt that legislation is going to go anywhere, but in light of that, I don't think Section 285 does apply to attorneys like the Americans. I think Rule 11 applies to attorneys. Section 1927 sanctions could apply to attorneys, but Section 285 does not. And I was on a panel about two years ago with the magistrate judge, and he was saying that one of the problems he has is if he has to sanction a party, or if he has to sanction an attorney, whether it be for discovery, misconduct, Rule 11, or any other fee-shifting provision, he also feels that he failed to manage the case himself. That's not something he takes lightly. It's something that weighs very heavily on him if you are sanctioning the attorneys as opposed to a party. Now, should there be a difference? We can debate that all day, but I think that's to me that's illustrative of how some judges think about these types of issues when it comes to handing down sanctions. One of the arguments today was based upon the assumption that it does not apply to parties. One of the arguments is that 285 is superfluous if its reach is not further than the inherent authority of the court to rule above it. And the response is that those actually only apply to attorneys, but 285 applies to parties. At least in our research, most of the cases involve assessment of fees against parties. But you have many of the fact patterns, though. When you do have an award of fees, the Federal Circuit affirms also the presence of some other type of sanctions of conduct, and they will apply many times on multiple grounds. The kind of activity here that I think is typical of district courts is you have an assessment against attorneys. Typically, a judge has a cool and hot period in reconsidering how quite often an initial sanction of an attorney. Your question is a real party of interest. Are we going to have sort of piercing the veil? Absolutely. That's what I'm thinking. And that's in terms of what the Congress will do. In your research, and you may all be right, in your research, did you find cases that positively stated that 285 is not applicable to attorneys? Or is that what you gleaned from cases that came close? I'd say it's what we gleaned. I don't know that it ever was an issue that someone asserted that we want you to sanction, I'm going to sanction the attorney, and I believe I have the authority to do so under 285. And then someone 
Judge would have to say you are the party. After hearing, though you've never filed and recorded an assignment, you really are the entity behind this case. I'm not sure what the legislative authority is for a district court to do that. Okay, so I think we have time for one more question. My name is Saba Ahmed. I'm actually working in the Senate Judiciary right now on the patent reform legislation. We're focused on the Northern District of California rule on the heightened pleading. So my question was, I attended the argument this morning. It was really fascinating. I wanted to know, could you guess from that sense, from like the judges questioning and like where the court is leaning towards with respect to those issues? Are you asking where the court is really leaning towards going from their questioning? Ask me if I can guess. Yeah. I don't want to be guessing. I'm not trying to do that. But I will tell you that lawyers all the time, appellate lawyers, go to arguments and they listen to the questions and they reach conclusions as to how the judge is leaning. But I have seen that that's not a 100% effective exercise. Because I've seen cases where a given judge went all the way one way and then wrote an opinion going all the way the other way. But obviously we all try to do that. And we all have copies of the transcript already. Some of them are sitting here. I have one here. And I didn't get a chance to finish reading it. But I read two thirds of it. And I checked one array for a reason. And then another line of questions raised some doubts about which column that justice is. But I wouldn't try to guess. There certainly is not going to be a nine to nothing opinion, I think, in any case. I have my own thoughts as to how it probably will go. But I wouldn't try to guess. I'm not going to venture my thoughts either. I don't think there's anything else. Thank you. 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 Thank you.